We've been on a wild weather roller coaster. This weekend we saw sweltering heat and record highs and today thunderstorms, lightning and rain. Snack cake lovers rejoice. Twinkies are back on store shelves nationwide. More than a thousand in Chico strapped on their running shoes and stripped off their clothes. I was out there and I actually saw more of Chico than I ever expected. To. <laughs> I bet you did. A whole lot more. <laughs> One that's part manure spreader, part hot rod. A gruesome discovery in Megalia. Three bodies were found inside a burning car. Authorities also found 300 pounds of processed marijuana, a bulletproof vest, and 19 guns, two of them fully automatic. We start tonight with breaking news out of Red Bluff. One person has reportedly been shot at 249 South Main Street near Tractor Supply Company. What stops me from grabbing a bunch from my backyard? That is an excellent question. Why, would you do that? No. I'd no. only charge you 20 bucks to pull some scales <laughs> off and put them on your face, you know. But, but I would charge me nothing. <laughs> All right. What's going on there, Elizabeth? Kara Allen, hundreds of people have been out here in front of the Chico Walmart to learn some very valuable lessons, but also to have fun. The fire department doesn't even have enough room for all of their vehicles, and when their main engine is parked inside, volunteers can barely get to their gear. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Gadley. Reading police are investigating after a young woman was hit and killed by a train. It happened just before five tonight on the tracks near the Girvin Road and East Side Road crossing. Police say the woman, believed to be in her 20s, was walking barefoot on the tracks. Witnesses told officers the woman flinched as the train sounded its horns. Passers-by even had time to get out of their cars and warn her to get off the tracks, but she didn't. Police say she died instantly. Officers aren't releasing her name until her family is notified. There are new developments tonight on the three bodies found in Wairika Creek. Two of them were found this month, the third last month. Siskiyou County Sheriff's officials now say the man found dead last Wednesday died of natural causes, but they have yet to determine his identity. The coroner today also released the name of the man whose body was found July 9th is 62-year-old Henry Cooper. Cooper's death has been ruled a homicide. The third victim, Christopher Schaefer, was found in North Wairika Creek near Deer Creek Way last November. His death has also been ruled a homicide. Police say both homicides are being actively investigated, but at this point, nothing links the two cases together. Meanwhile, they're asking people to stay out of Wairika Creek until further notice. Sutter County Sheriff's deputies are scouring the backyard of a live oak home after a startling discovery a human bone. Investigators were called to the home on Archer Avenue near L Street yesterday afternoon when a man cleaning up a rental property discovered a bone near an outbuilding. Deputies have not released any details about that bone, but have called in Chico State's Human Identification Lab in hopes of finding more of the skeleton. If we're At this point, investigators say they do not know how long the remains may have been in the yard, and until they find more of the skeleton, it will be difficult to determine age or gender of the body. The man accused of punching a Shasta College student and causing permanent brain damage in Chico last Halloween pleaded no contest today. 21-year-old Andre Rodriguez of Citrus Heights entered the plea this morning. Rodriguez hit 22-year-old Shasta College football player Tyler Burton during a scuffle in October of last year. Burton fell to the concrete sidewalk suffering skull fractures. He was in a coma for five weeks and is paralyzed on his left side. Butte County District Attorney Mike Ramsey says he wants to send a message that stupid, tragic violence will not be tolerated. Rodriguez faces up to four years in state prison when he's sentenced next month. The Cottonwood man accused of stabbing his wife was back in court for day five of his murder trial. Mark Duenas looked on as the prosecution continued to present their case. The afternoon was largely taken up by neighbors testifying they heard a scream coming from the direction of the Duenas house on the day of the murder. The prosecution plans to finish with their witnesses tomorrow. The defense will present their side on Tuesday. Duenas's attorney Ron Powell expects to question all of their witnesses in just one day. A man is recovering after a 15-foot fall from a cliff at Lake Oroville. Authorities were called out to Bidwell Canyon Bridge on Lake Oroville around 1.30 this morning for a report of a 25-year-old man that had fallen onto some rocks. Deputies say a group of people had been boating earlier in the evening and decided to climb a cliff near the bridge. The man reportedly slipped and fell, hitting his head. Authorities say some people in the group had been drinking and that could have been a factor. That's the unidentified man was unresponsive when rescue crews got to him at about 4.30 this morning, but deputies say he later regained consciousness. He was taken to the hospital suffering head trauma. There are close calls and then there are close calls. 
This one, much too close for comfort for two people in Gridley who are lucky to be alive. This four-door Toyota parked next to the train track south of Gridley was actually clipped by a freight train as it crossed the tracks at an old gravel road farm crossing just after 3 this afternoon. Now, as you can see, the car only lost its rear bumper. The driver and passenger were not hurt, but they say they apparently didn't see or hear the train coming when they crossed just in time, avoiding a potentially deadly situation. Turning now to weather, a warm but somewhat unsettled day. So what's it going to be like for the rest of the week? For the latest on the conditions, we check in with Chief Meteorologist Chris Kuiper in the Accu Weather Center. Chris. Thanks so much, Chris. With the recent suspension of several professional athletes tied to performance enhancing drugs, we decided to take a look at the situation on the local prep level. Action News Now reporter Kai Beach checked in on a local high school football program and has more. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Gadley. Shane Miller, the Shasta County man suspected of murdering his wife and two young daughters, is now on the U.S. Marshal's 15 most wanted list. The announcement was made today in Sacramento as federal agents step up efforts to track down the man who's been on the run for three months. Action News Now reporter Michelle Brock has more. Miller was last seen in Humboldt County. His truck was recovered there, but Miller was not. Now, there is a concern he may still go after family members or law enforcement trying to track him down. $25,000 reward is being offered for his arrest. The jury in the Mark Duenas murder trial could get the case as early as tomorrow after the defense presented its entire case in just two hours. Now, that's in contrast with the six days of full testimony the prosecution took. Action News Now reporter Charlene Chang has been following the trial closely and brings us the latest. Closing arguments are set to begin tomorrow morning. Jury deliberations will continue Thursday in the case of a former Butte County Sheriff's deputy charged with arranging to meet up with an underage girl for sex. 28-year-old Earl Clapperidge was arrested in May of last year after a sting operation that involved texts by an undercover officer impersonating a 14-year-old girl. Before the jury began deliberating Monday, Clapperidge took the stand in his own defense, saying he never intended to have sex with the girl, claiming he was gay. Prosecutors refute that, pointing out his marriage and evidence of past sexual encounters with women. Clapperidge faces four years in prison if convicted. After a year and a half, a suspect is finally behind bars for breaking into a Chico woman's home and sexually assaulting her. Police arrested 25-year-old Jeremy Scott today for the crime committed in January of last year. Officers say the 20-year-old victim was asleep in bed when Scott allegedly broke in and started assaulting her. The woman's boyfriend returned home during the attack and chased Scott out of the apartment. According to officers, it took so long to make the arrest because DNA evidence from the scene needed to be analyzed. Police say the victim was able to help identify the suspect through social media. Apparently, they had a class together at Butte College. Scott is not cooperating with the investigation. He's currently booked in the Butte County Jail. Turning now to weather, another hazy but delightfully cool day here in the North State. Now for the very latest on those conditions, we check in with Chief Meteorologist Chris Kuiper in the AccuWeather Center. Chris. The, uh, I, I was on my way out and the uh, clerk called me back to get my receipt. Moments later, the gunman walked up to Timothy Kirsten, raised his 9mm pistol, and pulled the trigger. The gun misfired, so he shot again, and Kirsten fell to the floor. When I got hit, I was out apparently for six, eight minutes, and I got up and walked out and drove the car away. To look at him now, you'd never know he was shot in the back of the head. The only signs left are two small scars, one in the back of his neck and the other in front of his ear. It cracked the skull. And I had, I think, five skull fractures that went through the sinuses and there was air in the cranium and the skull and all that. But I don't, you know, you just get back on the horse and get going. And that's very much Kirsten's attitude. He says not only has the ordeal made him appreciate his life, it made him stronger emotionally and physically. Through it all, he's kept his sense of humor. Physiologically, I'm probably stronger and better than I was a year ago. Okay. I don't recommend this as a therapy, okay? <laughs> In a shot therapy. Kirsten admits that not remembering the day does make it easier to have a positive outlook. The others were all conscious. <laughs> and I went out like a light. Okay. And uh, so I didn't have the, the grueling experience of being a hostage for three hours or four hours. Okay. That's, that's an ongoing grinding trauma. One year later, all three employees who were held hostage inside this bank are still working here. They say community support is what's gotten them through it. 
Bernie's always been a, a special branch, and the employees are very special. It says a lot about the support that they have from the community. Pretty much everyone involved says they're focusing on the future and trying not to spend too much time looking back at the past and that fateful day. We're, we're feeling very good about, you know, reaching this milestone and moving